This is a topic where I, th I think many of us have a lot to say and a lot of opinions and I want to make sure that um, you know, as many people who have something to say or a question to ask will have a chance to do that. So uh, I, I assure you there will be plenty of time for discussion. I suspect that uh, some of us will disagree on a number of issues. That's okay, we can disagree but we don't have to be disagreeable, so we will uh, be able to have a good uh, exchange. Um, now, this is always a challenging topic to talk about. There's a lot of uh, fear and discomfort uh, with uh, any discussion about Israel and Palestine. Uh, and in this country, it seems, that um, talking about this question is harder even than in Israel. The first thing I do every morning when I wake up is read the Israeli newspapers. And I find a much more vigorous debate about many of the questions I'm going to raise tonight in the Israeli newspapers than I do in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, or, or many, other, um, many other examples. Um, and it's, it's a noticeable phenomenon. It's noticeable that now there's an intense effort in many places to stop this discussion happening by uh, labeling people who are critical of Israel or who question the status quo, labeling them anti-Semitic and using other very ugly uh, and slanderous terms uh, to try and silence debate. And, um, that's another thing that we shouldn't allow to happen. We should allow people to express their opinions on this issue. Um, I, I want to start by just telling a, a story. When my mother was a little girl, she was born in Jerusalem. Her family had lived in Jerusalem, um, as far as we know, for centuries. There's a, a legend in the family that, uh, that they came from um, Spain in 1492 when Muslims were expelled by uh, the uh, Catholic uh, king and queen and that they moved to Jerusalem in 1492. So uh, we don't know if that's true. I, I, it's a family legend. But um, we don't like to say it because that means we have a very short history in Jerusalem of 600 years and uh, we don't like to admit that we're such relative newcomers. Um, but when my mother was a little girl, uh, she lived in a house in uh, a, an area of Jerusalem called Romema, uh, which my grandfather had built. And uh, they lived in this house with a Jewish family, a family of German Jews who uh, had moved to Palestine uh, in the previous years. This was in the uh, late 1930s. And they lived together very well. And that wasn't uncommon. My father, who is from a small village near Bethlehem, now in the occupied West Bank, also tells, uh, although he came from a different kind of setting than my mother. My mother came from a, a relatively well-to-do uh, Jerusalem family. Uh, my father came from a, a very poor rural uh, background. Uh, he was one of the uh, first people, if not the first people from the, the village to, to go to university. And it was common for people in the village n not to have any formal schooling. I remember my aunts, uh, uh, my father's elder sisters, um, never had any schooling. They were incredibly wise, learned, and smart uh, women, but they didn't read or write because they had never had uh, that schooling. Uh, but even in that very rural setting, uh, my father remembers very close friendships with Jewish people uh, who had lived in Palestine for uh, forever, who were native to the country. We have to remember that before the Zionist colonization of Palestine, there was a Jewish community in the country that had been there uh, for a, a long time. 
And uh, the point I'm making is that uh, conflict was not inevitable, that we can imagine an alternative future, uh, uh, alternatives to, to what has happened. We tend to think of, of what's happened as being a chain in events for which there were no other possibilities. Um, now, the life that my mother knew as a, as a child uh, in Jerusalem came to an end, a very abrupt end, in um, late 1947, when their village, the Lifta Romema area, was attacked by uh, Zionist militias and the population were expelled. Um, the, the, the date is significant uh, because one of the great myths which is propagated routinely uh, by uh, some people uh, is that um, you know, Palestinians became refugees because Arab states attacked the new state of Israel and, uh, and then in the war they became refugees. No Arab state entered the conflict before May 15, 1948. And the fact is that uh, most of the Palestinians who became refugees became refugees starting in early 1948. Um, and this is something now that, that uh, I won't go into all the history here, but you're, you can ask me about it, uh, was a, a campaign of uh, what's now called ethnic cleansing. There's a good book about this by an Israeli historian, Ilan Pape, a new book called The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine that uh, goes into all the detail in the historical record. Um, now, this is something that of course, is, is very shameful and frightening for Israelis to admit because the whole idea of the State of Israel is that it's supposed to be something very moral, something very legitimate, something very good. So to admit that this uh, state was created through the expulsion of a people who are already there is something that's very, very hard to do. And that's one example of the, the difficulty of talking about this history. How we view history uh, reflects on how we view ourselves now. If we view ourselves as inheritors of this history, then we feel a necessity to defend or deny it or somehow cover it up. Um, I don't think that's the right approach. I don't think the right way for us in, in this country to uh, deal with the legacy of slavery is to deny that it ever happened. The, the, the right approach is to admit it, to examine it, to learn from it, and to make reparations and restitution to its victims and their descendants. I would say the same is true uh, in any kind of uh, grave injustice in history, no matter who its victims are or who the perpetrators are. Now, we can't undo the, the, the tape of history. We can't rewind history like a, a videotape. Most of you probably have no idea what a videotape is. It's a very ancient technology that you won't encounter anymore. But uh, I'm old enough to remember. Um, but we have to think about what justice looks like today and going forward. The, uh, the, the reality today is that there are uh, about 11, 12 million people living in Palestine, Israel, whatever you want to call it. 50% um, of them are Israeli Jews, and 50% of them are Palestinians. And that's the reality. And it, it's, it's possible that some of the Israeli Jews wish they could blink their eyes and open them and all the Palestinians would have disappeared. And some Palestinians may wish the same of Israeli Jews. Now, uh, if you decide that all of the history I've told you is wrong, that I made it all up, and that I'm telling horrible slanders against the State of Israel, it doesn't change a thing. It doesn't change the reality that there are five million Israeli Jews in the country and five million Palestinians. And uh, we do not believe in the 21st century 
that, uh, that uh, the sins of the fathers should be visited onto their children for generation after generation. All the people in the country, regardless of their race, religion, or ethnicity, have a right to life, to dignity, to, uh, to, to a good life, and to safety, and to, to their religion, or to not have a religion if they don't want to, and to live uh, the way they want to. What no, none of the people have is the right to deny that to others, to say that my beliefs, my religion, my ethnicity is so much more important and so much more valuable that it takes first place. We've seen what uh, countries like that look like. We've seen it in this country where we had institutionalized uh, uh, white supremacy for uh, centuries. Um, I heard a government official uh, the other day saying that the United States is the oldest democracy in the world. It was the strangest statement I've ever heard. The last time I checked, uh, uh, black people only got the vote about uh, 40 years ago. Women only got it about 80 years ago. Uh, people who didn't own property uh, only got it shortly before that. Uh, and uh, there's still millions of people in this country, undocumented people who, although they work and pay taxes and, uh, 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 and uh, live among us, uh, keep the prices of our food low by providing very cheap uh, labor, are still uh, completely disenfranchised and un unrepresented. Uh, despite all of that, uh, we still have the goal to talk about ourselves uh, as a great democracy of 200 years, as though the fact that women couldn't vote, African Americans couldn't vote, uh, actually couldn't even be free people, as if that doesn't matter. Um, it's a very strange way of defining democracy. And of course, it also, uh, similar logic applies when you hear the claims that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. Well, it's only a democracy if it doesn't matter to you that five million Palestinians, half the population living under the uh, authority and power of the state of Israel, are totally disenfranchised. Four million of them live under military occupation in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, where they have no rights whatsoever. They, have, they don't have the right to move from village to village. They don't have the right to build houses on their own land. They don't have the right to farm much of their land. Now they are being walled into giant ghettos. The city of Bethlehem, the birthplace of Christ, is now walled off completely. Its inhabitants are prisoners in a giant ghetto. Tul Karim, Qalqilia, Nablus, all walled cities, like the medieval cities you see in your history books where, with a big wall around them, except in those days the walls were built to keep invaders out. These walls are built to imprison entire populations. And then you have a million citizens, ostensibly Palestinians who are citizens of the State of Israel, who have nominally the right to vote. But that's where their rights end. They're not equal before the law. Israel has 26 basic laws. It doesn't have a written constitution. It has uh, a series of basic laws. Not one basic law guarantees the right to equality before the law. There is no equality before the law in Israel. Your rights depend on your uh, religion. Uh, there are dozens of nationalities recognized in Israel, and it's written on your identity card what your nationality is. None of them is Israeli. If you are a citizen of Israel, you cannot have Israeli written on your identity card. It, there's no such thing. The Israeli Supreme Court ruled in 1972, there is no such thing as an Israeli nationality. There is Jewish nationality, and then there are all the others. So, the state of Israel is the only state in the world that is not a state of its citizens. Every other country, whether it abuses its citizens' rights or respects them, 
It's the state of its citizens. Israel is the only country which claims to be the state of a particular ethnic group. So that someone Israel recognizes as a Jew from Lithuania or Moldova or from New York, who's never set foot in the country, has more rights in Israel than a Palestinian born in the country and raised there and who's lived there all their life. It's an unprecedented uh, uh, situation, uh, almost. It, it's not quite without uh, precedent. The, uh, this situation is one that wasn't supposed to be. The founders of the State of Israel recognized early on uh, that there was a problem. They set the goal of establishing a, a state for Jews in Palestine. But they recognized very early on that uh, there was already another people there. And what I argue, uh, and, and for those who are interested, uh, the book is called One Country. What I argue in, in, in my book is that the, the problem, or rather the solution that people talk about today, division of the land, partition, is not the solution, it's the problem. The root of the conflict, the root of the conflict was the effort to create in Palestine which was a multi-religious, multi-ethnic country, to take this multi-religious, multi-ethnic country and to turn it into an exclusively Jewish state. It's been a disaster, first and foremost for the Palestinians, who have been the principal victim of this effort, but also for Israelis. And I would argue more widely for uh, Jewish people around the world, who, whether they like it or not, have been implicated in this enterprise. Today, we have a situation where Israel claims to be a Jewish and democratic state. The basis for this claim is that within the borders on which Israel was established in 1948, there is a Jewish majority of about uh, 70 or 80 percent. Uh, roughly between 70 and 80 percent, depending on whose figures you look at. This majority, as I mentioned, was created through the forced removal or, the, or preventing the return of Palestinians who are forced out or fled or who are out of the country for any reason. But it requires us to maintain the fiction that Israel is somehow separate from the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And this is a very important fiction in the minds of Israelis because it's only by mentally separating themselves from the West Bank and Gaza Strip that they can think of Israel being this discrete Jewish entity and the rest being some foreign territory. We see that with Gaza, where the Israelis claim that they withdrew from the Gaza Strip in 2005. They say, we're not responsible for Gaza. We left. We were so generous, we left. And look how the Palestinians behave like animals. Of course, we see now the reality that uh, the Gaza Strip is completely controlled by Israel. It's surrounded on all sides by the Israeli army. No one gets in and out without Israeli permission unless they dig a tunnel underneath which, of course, they have to do because it's the only way to evade the occupation. Israel controls the population registry. No one in Gaza can get an identity card or a pass to travel without the permission of Israel. Israel controls the airspace. It controls the sea. It controls uh, all, all of everything that goes in and out. It controls the water, the electricity, and the fuel. And this is what gives the lie to the idea. Uh, I mean, you, you may have heard in the news that the Palestinians have a president and they have not one but two prime ministers. It's really a unique situation. Uh, they don't have a state, but they have more prime ministers per capita than any other uh, nation on earth. 
But these prime ministers and presidents control nothing. There's only one government in the country that decides if people in Gaza eat or drink or have light or darkness or can travel or not or have enough antibiotics or have uh, dialysis or who have uh, uh, the ability to give birth safely or whether women will give birth at checkpoints in dangerous conditions. There's one government. It's the government of the State of Israel. It's the same government that decides whether people in Qalqilia, in Nablus, in Bethlehem, everywhere else will, will uh, enjoy the minimum uh, ability to, to uh, uh, function. The problem with this government is that it is a, uh, a sectarian government. It is a government by, of, and for half the people of the country, Jewish people. And the challenge for us is to think beyond this, to recognize that what we already have on the ground is one country. And uh, that's something that was recognized by, um, by Ehud Olmert, the current Prime Minister of Israel, in 2003, when he said, we're approaching the point where more and more Palestinians will say there is no place for two states between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, that is, in all of historic Palestine. All we want is the right to vote. The day we get it, the day they get it, we will lose everything. Uh, he's, uh, I shudder to think, Almut added, that liberal Jewish organizations that shouldered the burden of struggle against uh, apartheid in South Africa will lead the struggle against us. That was Ehud Olmert in 2003, recognizing the dilemma that Israel faces. The solution is to end this situation of radical inequality and to provide full civil, political, cultural, economic, and human rights to all the people in the country. That's the solution. It's as simple as that. Getting there isn't simple. But the alternative is a nightmare. And the alternative is apartheid. You already have uh, in uh, Israel uh, many people who recognize quite openly that what Israel is, is creating is apartheid. Among them Ehud uh, Olmert, who I just uh, quoted. But there are others who argue that Israel must not be deterred that Israel must carry on at all costs. One of those uh, is a fellow called Arnon Sofer, who was one of the senior advisors to the former Prime Minister Ariel Sharon, who helped to design the uh, Gaza disengagement plan, the so-called disengagement, which meant removing 8,000 settlers from Gaza and then claiming that a million and a half Gazans are no longer the responsibility of Israel. This is what he said. This is what Arnon Sofer said about the policy that he supports and helps, helped to design. This is what he said in 2004. Unilateral separation doesn't guarantee peace. It guarantees a Jewish Zionist state with an overwhelming majority of Jews. What will be the price of this achievement? The day after unilateral separation, the Palestinians will bombard us with artillery fire. And we will have to retaliate, but at least the war will be at the fence, not in the kindergartens in Tel Aviv and Haifa. We will tell the Palestinians that if a single missile is fired over the fence, we will fire 10 in response, and women and children will be killed, and houses will be destroyed. Further down the line, when two and a half million people live in a closed off Gaza, it's going to be a human catastrophe. Those people will become even bigger animals than they are today, with the aid of an insane fundamentalist Islam. The pressure is going to be awful. It's going to be a terrible war. So if we want to remain alive, we will have to kill and kill and kill all day, every day. 
And that's precisely what is happening now in Gaza. With every day, we hear in the news about these Qassam rockets coming and hitting the town of Sterot. And I think in the past 10 years, they have killed about five or six Israelis, which is five or six Israelis too many, and caused minor damage. And they terrify Israeli children, as any child would be terrified. Nobody hears about the scale of the indiscriminate bombardment in Gaza every day, which kills children on a weekly basis, which uh, uh, causes terror to, uh, to millions. The, the one is not an excuse uh, for the other. But that's the formula. That is what uh, Israel has come up with, that we simply keep bombing and bludgeoning and walling and imprisoning and demolishing until the Palestinians get the message. As the former Israeli chief of staff, Moshe Ya'alon, said uh, uh, two years ago, uh, he said, the, Isra the Palestinians have to understand that they are a defeated people. This is the Israeli strategy. That's as imaginative as it gets. That's at, the, uh, at one end of the spectrum. At the other is the, uh, the growing phenomenon is in Israel of people calling for outright expulsion. Uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Israel, Avigdor Lieberman, heads a party that calls openly for Palestinians to be expelled from the country, for Palestinians with Israeli citizenship to be stripped of that citizenship, and so on. So the return to the mainstream, in a sense, of, of ethnic cleansing. And there's barely an outcry about it, certainly uh, not one that would prevent someone like Lieberman becoming deputy prime minister. And at the other, at the sort of the most dovish end of the spectrum, there are people who continue to talk about a two-state solution. Re some realizing, uh, and others perhaps not, that the clock on that has run out, that, that there is no partition that uh, can be agreed uh, for this country. And what I argue in the book is that we have to... We have, to, we have to question when we're told time and again a two-state solution is the only solution. There is no other solution. Uh, anything else is a catastrophe. We hear that time and again. Well, the two-state solution has been on the table since 1937. And 70 years later, we're no closer to achieving it. And uh, uh, Condoleezza Rice is trying to put together a summit in Annapolis. Later this year, we don't know when. No agenda has been agreed for it. Uh, the, the, a a tailor-made Palestinian leadership, selected by Israel and the United States, cannot agree with Israel on what to discuss. The chances of any of this leading to a reasonable solution are less than nil. And it's not only everyone uh, uh, watching this who knows it, but the participants themselves know it. And so there is a great deal of cynicism and self-interest uh, for, for those who are going through uh, these motions. So while, but while we're told that the two-state solution, this 70-year-old failure, this 70-year-old catastrophe, is the only solution. We bury our heads in the sand and refuse to look at other similar situations where real reconciliation has been achieved in very similar and sometimes even worse situations. And in the book, I focus a lot on South Africa. Uh, many people know, many people have heard the comparison, and people dispute it. Some people say it's apt, and others argue against it. But I think there is a good comparison in this sense, that after 300 years of white minority rule, it was possible for a peaceful end to apartheid in South Africa, and a, trans, uh, and a, uh, a transition to a democratic constitution which gave everyone equal rights. All the fears of white South Africans uh, are reflected in the fears that Israeli Jews express today. 
And let me uh, read you a little segment that illustrates that. Two little segments, if you'll allow me. Some of you may remember F.W. de Klerk. He was the last white president of apartheid South Africa. And he said uh, in 2004 that uh, <clears throat> the roadmap, the US-sponsored peace plan that is supposed to lead to the creation of a Palestinian state looked exactly like the plan for grand apartheid that Henrik Verford set in motion in the mid-1950s. The idea was originally sound, de Klerk said. As a young parliamentarian, I was enthusiastic about forming independent homelands for every group, including the Afrikaners, the whites. The roadmap between Israel and Palestine is based on exactly the same principles. What apartheid originally wanted to achieve is what everybody now says is the solution in Israel and Palestine, namely partitioning, separate nation states on the basis of ethnicity, different cultures, different languages. Now, I, I'm, I'm end of the quote. Now, I say, the basic principle behind Grand Apartheid was that whites would preserve and normalize their power by manipulating the demographics and political boundaries of South Africa to create nominally independent black states. All blacks would be given citizenship in these states and therefore the apartheid planners thought they could forestall demands for blacks to vote in South Africa. Exactly the logic that Ehud Olmert gives for trying to create a quick, a quick and dirty Palestinian state that gets all those inconvenient Palestinians off Israel's books, but without really giving up any control over their uh, lives. Now, de Klerk talked about what this transition uh, meant in the midst of the uh, increasing violence and chaos of South Africa in the late 1980s and early 1990s, where uh, uh, you, you uh, may remember that thousands of South Africans were being killed in violence. There were massive uprisings. There was a state of emergency. Whites feared that if, uh, if they lost power, they would all be driven out of the country or killed. And it was in this context that uh, de Klerk is talking. Resistance to apartheid stiffened as rioting and violence turned widespread, as thousands of non-whites were killed, imprisoned, and tortured, and as South Africa's isolation grew. Some Afrikaners, like de Klerk, acknowledged that there was only one way out of the impasse. Whites had to overcome their fear of black domination and agree to negotiate with the ANC, the African National Congress, whom they had for decades vilified as a revolutionary terrorist organization bent on their destruction. This embattled and fearful community of four million South Africans, South African whites, was, I'm quoting the clerk now, riding the tiger of growing black anger and increasing international isolation. They faced the world and 35 million black South Africans who were shouting at white South Africans to dismount. The problem for a minority that had been in power for so long and caused so much suffering was that it was difficult for them to do so. To see, excuse me, it was difficult for them to see how they could do so without being devoured. For white South Africans, de Klerk said in 2004, acceptance of a one-man, one-vote solution evoked very much the same fears and reaction that could be expected from Israelis were they ever asked to consign their fate to a one-man, one-vote election in greater Israel-Palestine in which they would be heavily outnumbered. So there's nothing new at all in the situation. Like Zionism, Afrikaner nationalism is built around a national 
ethos in which uh, uh, whites were the victims. Now, the rest of the world saw them as the oppressors, which is why there was uh, such a, 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 a big international campaign against apartheid. But in the national narrative of Afrikaners, they were the victims. And they truly had been victims in history. Um, you, may, you may have read that the first use of the term concentration camp was not in relation to the Nazis and the uh, 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 extermination of uh, the Jews in Europe. It was in relation to the concentration camps that the British put the Africana uh, communities in during the Boer War in uh, the first decade of the uh, 20th century, in which uh, a significant part of the Africana population was wiped out. And this was the national myth that they built their uh, nationalism around, that we survived an attempted extermination and we will always be independent. We will always rely on ourselves. Of course, the problem was that those who had victimized the Afrikaners were not those who they were victimizing. The uh, uh, Africans had no responsibility for what the British had done to the Afrikaners, and yet they were asked to pay the price. Similarly, nobody can deny, and no one should uh, deny, the horror of what, Europe, uh, uh, what Christian Europe did to the Jews in the Holocaust. No one can deny the scale of that. And the uh, notion that the uh, Holocaust somehow justifies the uh, expulsion or the victimization or, or allows us to disregard the rights of Palestinians is equally uh, false and untenable. What I want to say before opening the discussion is that what I believe that what was possible in South Africa is possible in Israel-Palestine, even more so. What it will take, though, is for what brought about the change in South Africa was not that uh, whites woke up one morning and said, we've been wrong all these years, and we, uh, you know, and now we should do the right thing. That's not how change happens. The change came about because whites felt their power draining away. As long as they felt they could control the situation, they didn't listen. They didn't open their ears to anything that Africans were saying. They said, you're terrorists, you're barbarians, you come from an uncivilized culture. If you get power, you'll behave like all the other barbarians in Africa. We are part of the West, we are Democrats. These were all the, the, the arguments they used. When they felt their power draining away because of the isolation, because of the internal resistance, and frankly because of the end of the Cold War and the end of, the, of US support for apartheid, they said, what have you got? Let's listen. We're ready to listen now. They saw when F.W. de Klerk came into power, he, he had an assessment done by the South African military and security chiefs. And they said, Mr. President, we can hold on to power indefinitely. We have enough force. We have enough guns. We have enough tanks. But the cost will be that we have to kill and kill and kill. We may have to kill hundreds of thousands of people to maintain our power. And at that point, White said, we can't do this anymore. The internal solidarity of that community wouldn't hold, and they said, we have to negotiate our way out. Let's get the best deal. While we're still in charge, let's get the best deal. And it took the ANC, it took the leadership of Oliver Tambo and uh, Nelson Mandela and many others to recognize that uh, there was no such thing as total, that victory uh, that, that it was a stalemate, that each side could prevent the other getting what they wanted, but neither side could prevail on its own terms. And that was the basis for 
a, a democratic transition. I make an argument, I won't go into it at length now, but if you ask me about it, I will. A exactly analogous process happened in Northern Ireland. And the same has to happen in Israel-Palestine. It won't happen as long as Israelis feel that their power is so superior that they don't have to listen. As long as they can dismiss Palestinians as barbarians, as uncivilized people, as uh, strange oriental alien creatures who don't share the same civilization, they, they, they will, they'll do that as long as they feel they can get away with it. But when the power starts to slip away, they will talk. And the power will slip away in several ways. One clearly is demographically. Uh, Israel is unable to maintain a Jewish majority. And this is a cause of great uh, panic uh, among the Israeli leadership. But there are also other ways that uh, Israeli power may be challenged. The uh, bedrock of Israeli power, one of the myths on which support for Israel is built, is that Israel is independent, that it's this independent Jewish force, that if ever Jews are threatened, that Jews can gather there and they'll be safe. This is, of course, a myth, because Israel has always relied on and depended for its existence on the sponsorship of a great power. Without uh, Great Britain, Israel would not have been created. Without U.S. support, massive U.S. support for decades, Israel uh, would not have been maintained, and it certainly couldn't have maintained its occupation of the West Bank, Gaza, and the Golan Heights for all these decades. So another loss of power might be that Americans decide they no longer want to pay the price of supporting Israel. And we're already seeing a growing debate in this country about uh, the wisdom of unconditional support for Israel. And Israel, Israel, Israel's establishment understands that this debate is threatening, which is why there is an enormous effort to label anyone who questions that alliance as being anti-Semitic in order to shut it down. And then, of course, there is a resistance of different kinds. There's a, a Palestinian resistance, and the vast majority of Palestinian resistance is non-violent. It takes the form of simply refusing uh, you know, we will not recognize this illegal and immoral situation. We will maintain our steadfastness. You can starve us, you can cut us off, you can do what you want. We won't submit to it. We will not, as Moshe Ya'alon said, understand that we are a defeated people. We will refuse to be a defeated people. And ask yourselves why it is that Israel needs the recognition so desperately of the starving in Gaza. Why does Israel, that is so powerful, need the starving in Gaza to recognize its right to exist? Because there is great power in the refusal of uh, those people to grant that legitimacy. And finally, we may see a growing resistance in the form of international solidarity. And we also see a growing movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions modeled very explicitly on the anti-apartheid movement. And that's something I support. I don't support starving Israeli mothers uh, and children as, as Palestinians are being starved in Gaza. I don't support cutting off fuel and electricity to Israeli households. I don't support uh, building walls around Israelis so they can't move around. But I do support boycott, divestment, and sanctions, which is a nonviolent way to send the message to Israel that the status quo is unacceptable. But the other side of that has to be that we start to put forward a vision of what like life looks like in a post-Israeli apartheid situation and start to discuss among ourselves how Israeli Jews and Palestinians can build a common life. And that's what I try to begin in the book. I certainly don't have all the answers, but I can see a future where Israeli Jews have a vibrant and growing presence in the country, where the outward migration of Israeli Jews who uh, are so disillusioned with the situation is stopped and, and perhaps some come home because it becomes a better place to live. Where Palestinians uh, are given 
the life and dignity they've been denied so, for so long, and we return to the kind of life that existed in the past on new terms for the 21st century of civic inclusion, full participation for everyone, and strict equality for all human beings. I think that's possible. I'll stop there, and I invite your questions and comments, and of course, there are many, many things I left out. I could go on for hours and not cover everything, but I will trust you to bring up those issues that, uh, uh, that uh, I didn't touch on that are important to you. Thank you. That's a good question. Remember, of course, there are no exact analogies, but there is one. If you remember, <clears throat> during the anti-apartheid struggle, especially towards the end, when there was escalating fighting between the African National Congress on the one hand and the Inkata Freedom Party, the, led by Butelezi on the other hand, in which thousands of people in the townships were being killed, far outnumbering by orders of magnitude the infighting which occurred between Palestinians. And there, of course, the, the thing we have in common between the Fatah and Hamas uh, fight on one hand and the ANC and Qatar fight on the other was that that fight was instigated and very much supported by the regime in power. The apartheid regime had a great interest in stoking this civil war among Africans. And we've seen that among Palestinians. Of course, there have to be willing Palestinian collaborators, but those collaborators would not have been able to act without arms and weapons from Israel and the United States to try to undermine Hamas after its election victory. But the, the, the dispute between Fatah and Hamas is not, is not in my analysis, a reflection of a deep fissure in Palestinian society, any more than the fighting between the ANC and Ankata was. There was not a great constituency among black South Africans for preserving apartheid or maintaining the Bantustan system. Uh, so the Ankata ANC split didn't really, wasn't really deep. And in the same way, among Palestinians, there's great unity about the core issues of the Palestinian struggle. And really, uh, the, the split is between, and, and we're seeing this region-wide, where the US is propping up unrepresentative leaderships in Lebanon, in Palestine, in Iraq, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan. And this is the strategy, that uh, when you can't, uh, when you can't uh, get a government uh, when a popularly elected or a legitimate government doesn't go along with U.S. bidding, you change it for a government that will. And that's what we have now uh, in the Ramallah Green Zone. We have a, a small elite of Palestinian leaders who are favored by the U.S. and the West, who have money showered on them, but who do not, whose writ does not run beyond the Ramallah Green Zone. And uh, the Israelis and Americans fool themselves perhaps, maybe they're smarter than they let on, that these are the Palestinian leaders they can make a deal with. Now, in South Africa and in Northern Ireland, when they made the transition from uh, ethnic rule to democracy, um, there had to be multi-party negotiations in which all the parties were included and all the tendencies in each society. So that included Sinn Féin and the IRA and the SDLP and the DUP and the uh, UUP and all the other parties in Northern Ireland, whether they were for reconciliation or against it, whether they had engaged in armed struggle or terrorism or not, whether it was state terrorism or paramilitary terrorism or anything else. South Africa as well, there were, had to be um, multi-party negotiations. And I think we'd have to have a similar process when it came to the point of, of uh, making that transition. 
And uh, we have to recognize that there are multiple Palestinian voices. Within Israel, there's a major pro-democracy movement led by Palestinians. The Palestinian citizens of Israel are in the forefront of advocating for Israel to be transformed from an ethnic state into a state of all its citizens. Um, some groups, like Adala, there's the Haifa Declaration, which is a statement of principle from Palestinian leaders in Israel. The Adala, a Palestinian civil rights group in Israel, has drafted uh, a model constitution for a democratic state. Even Hamas, you know, there's a caricature of Hamas, and then there's Hamas. Um, Hamas itself has changed a great deal and is trying. It's, it's trying to make the kind of transition that uh, the IRA and Sinn Féin made to, be, to becoming mainstream political movements. And you see that in the actions and statements of its leaders since uh, uh, 2005. First, they suspended the campaign of suicide attacks on Israeli civilians that had really uh, made them notorious, but still, to a great extent, defines their image in the West. Um, they entered into the political process, they stood for elections, implicitly recognizing the institutions that had been set up. Since the elections, they uh, have issued um, uh, a large number of statements, they've called for a long-term truce with Israel, they've offered a number of, um, of uh, uh, of, of unilateral truces, which uh, Israel's never responded to. But their main idea, what they call the hudna, a long-term truce, and they say, well, right now we don't see a political solution to the conflict, but we think there needs to be an end to the bloodshed. So we call for a long-term truce, a generation-long truce, and we leave it up to a future generation whether it would be renewed. Now that is a, a dramatic change in their position. And it's one where if the Israelis didn't feel so strong and, and, you know, like we don't have to listen, they would take that as a serious opening. But because the Israelis still feel immune, they're in the stage of the South Africans where they said the ANC are just revolutionary terrorists and barbarians, we don't have to listen to them. Uh, uh, you know, the Israelis ignore that. They, they, it's all insincere. They really want to destroy us. We don't have to listen to this. Um, I think if Israelis were wise, they would listen to it. And there are some Israelis, like Ephraim Halevi, the uh, former head of the Mossad, who said uh, publicly that we have to talk to Hamas, that we have no choice but to talk to them. But most of the Isra Israeli society still feels immune, and we, don't have to, we can ignore them. So, yes, Hamas too are serious interlocutors, and they have to be part of any process. Look, the Palestinian Authority was a creation of Oslo. It's a fiction. It's not a real government, and I think that it's a fiction that largely uh, helps Israeli consciences by maintaining the fiction that Israel doesn't rule over the Palestinians. Uh, it's, it's of no consequence. Neither, it's, you know, it's neither here nor there. The underlying political movements, though, are, are important. Well, the, the state of emergency in itself is not, you know, the, the Israelis, as a matter of convenience, simply adopted the 1945 emergency regulations, but they introduced many, many more oppressive laws and military orders of their own under which Palestinians live. And, and don't forget that from 1948 to 1966, the Palestinians within Israel, those who are nominally citizens, lived under uh, military rule as well. Um, the, the, the main reason for uh, the, you know, Israel has a whole series of laws that uh, are designed to privilege Jews and to disenfranchise non-Jews from the law of return, the uh, absentee property law, the, entry, the, the law of entry into Israel. There's about 25, 30 laws which are designed to disenfranchise not just Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, but particularly Palestinians within Israel. All that would have to be changed, absolutely. Uh, the, 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 um, the idea of, uh, of 
If a Jewish state means a state that discriminates against non-Jews, then that's inadmissible, and Israel has no right to be such a state. There's no right to be a racist state, and nor should there be. What I would see in a, a, a one-state solution, again, I stress, we have now a de facto one-state solution, but it's an apartheid state. In a democratic one-state, I would see uh, uh, a number of, uh, you know, I, I think there are some fundamental principles, and I tried to set those out uh, in the book. I set out eight principles which uh, would have to... Uh, be included in any kind of uh, settlement. I'm trying to see if I can find them now. I'm not going to read all eight to you, but um, there's one in particular that I think is fundamental, and I actually borrowed it. Why do the hard work myself when Brilliant Minds did it for me? I borrowed it from the uh, Belfast Agreement, which, which has brought an end to the conflict in Northern Ireland. And I think it states it beautifully, which is why I, I took it and adapted it for the situation. But it says, and again, think of this in American terms, there's nothing controversial about it. But in, in, in Israel, Israel terms, it's, it's suddenly unacceptable. But it, it says this, the power of the government shall be exercised with rigorous impartiality on behalf of all the people in the diversity of their identities and traditions and shall be founded on the principles of full respect for and equality of civil, political, social, and cultural rights, and of freedom from discrimination for all citizens, women and men, and of parity of esteem, and of just and equal treatment for the identity, ethos, and aspirations of all communities. Now, there's a number of other principles that, that I lay out. The point is that I think there's any number of structures that could accommodate them. So you could have structures which give different communities uh, some cultural autonomy of uh, broadcasting, language, education. There are all kinds of ways to imagine that. Of course, Israel, Israeli Jewish society isn't monolithic. It's, it's, it's diverse and hierarchical. One of the tragedies of Israeli Jewish society is how the Ashkenazi uh, 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 European Jews uh, suppressed and, uh, and, um, and denigrated the culture of Arab Jews, of Mizrahim. And so Mizrahim too, who are actually the largest group of Jews in the country, should have the right to restore their cultures and languages and, and the dignity of their cultures that were so denigrated by the Ashkenazi elite for decades. So there are all kinds of ways we can bring, actually bring more diversity into the country and provide structures and expression for people to do that. And to make the country again, I mean, Jews lived in Palestine for uh, centuries, for, from time immemorial. Uh, there, was, there were Jewish communities in Jerusalem and Safad and Tiberias, and it was a safe place for them to live. I told you about uh, uh, my parents' recollections. Why can't it be like that again? I, I think it can, and that's what I would see. A place where Jews want to come instead of one they want to flee from, as they're doing now in, in large numbers. I don't really understand the connection. I mean, what Palestinians, you, you, you will know that from 1936 to 1939, there was a Palestinian uprising against the uh, policy of the colonial power, the British uh, mandatory power, to uh, support the Zionist plan to convert Palestine from being a majority Arab country into a country where the majority population would be uh, European settlers. And that's what Palestinians were resisting. And uh, the British had made very clear since 1917 their support for European settlement in Palestine. And the Zionists were very clear 
that their goal was to establish, to settle the country, and to, to uh, replace the people who were there. The British didn't consider the rights of the indigenous people to be important. They had, they had uh, a, a, a global empire in which the rights of indigenous people were not important. Uh, it was a, 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 you know, a white supremacist and racist empire. So the British didn't take Palestinian rights very seriously. And you'll know that they, 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 they executed, exiled, and imprisoned thousands of Palestinians from 1936 to 39 for resisting uh, British, uh, uh, the, the, the settlement in the country. The, you referred to the 1937 Peel Commission. The Peel Commission recommended partition, but what it also said was that partition is impossible without the forced transfer of hundreds of thousands of Arabs, because Jews controlled very little territory and they were dotted around. There was no way you could partition the country without the forced transfer of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians. So Palestinians rightly rejected that and they rejected policies that they clearly perceived as being designed to disenfranchise them and dispossess them of their country. You know, you can talk about all of that history what I said at the beginning was it really doesn't change. What the Arab Higher Committee said in 1938 or 39 doesn't change the situation we have today, which is that you have 12 million people in the country and they need to live together. They can't live apart because there's no way to separate them without committing more atrocities. And uh, so they have to live together. They may not like it. I guarantee you that people in Northern Ireland don't like each other. There's still a great deal of hatred between um, uh, Irish nationalist Catholic communities and pro-British Protestant communities, but they all understand that, that neither is going to defeat the other and they have to have a democratic constitution that gives everyone equal rights. That's why they support it across the board even though they don't like each other. Now that there's peace in the country, because there is a just political settlement, there's a chance that, those, uh, that, that, that uh, hatred that has developed over many generations might begin to thaw. But it can't begin to thaw without there being a, a political framework that is just for that to happen. So I think it's just the pragmatic reality. I mean, what are Israel's options? Ethnic cleansing, apartheid, or, 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 uh, or what, or, or, or giving everyone equal rights. The view of the, Palesti the Palestinian leadership always was for a unitary state with proportional representation. And uh, it was the, the adamant view of the Zionist leadership that there had to be a Jewish state uh, controlled by Jews. There were dissenters in the Zionist movement who supported a binational or unitary state, but they were a minority and they were adamantly opposed. Now, I'm not arguing that historically Palestinians were the great advocates of a one-state solution. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that the conditions for that exist now, the necessity for it exists now, and going forward, that's really where things are going to go. And I think we're in a position where we can either deny it or work with it. But, you know, going back to history will not save us from dealing with the present dilemma. Those are two very good questions. And, and what I said is that I don't think, as long as Israelis for the most part, think they can get away with uh, uh, maintaining a monopoly on power and privilege, I think they will. Uh, I think that once they start to perceive their um, power uh, threatened seriously uh, and that they have no alternative, once they've tried building walls and it fails, once they've tried keeping Palestinians in ghettos and it fails, once they've tried all these things and they fail, and they will fail, I mean, they'll fail at a very, very high cost. It will be very ugly, but they will fail. Once they fail, 
they may reach a point that the South Africa, white South Africans did where they say, we can keep doing this, we can maintain power, but the cost of this is, one, is a cost we're not willing to pay. And I think it's at that point that they will say, okay, we have to negotiate our way out. Seriously, real negotiations to find a way out. That's in our best interest. I can't tell you whether that will be in two years or five years or 10 years or 15 years. It will depend on a number of things. It will depend, as I said, on the level and type of Palestinian resistance to what Israel is doing, international resistance. So far, there's been high, very high international tolerance for what Israel is doing. I mean, an example of that is, you know, the, the West won't talk to the democratically elected government of the Palestinians on the basis that it doesn't recognize Israel and it won't renounce violence. But they talk to Israel despite the fact that the Deputy Prime Minister openly advocates ethnic cleansing and Israel kills far more Palestinians in a year, every year, than Hamas has killed in its entire history, Israelis. So there's a double standard as well. So, uh, uh, that's a slight tangent, but my point is, if international tolerance starts to fray, if the grassroots boycott, divestment and sanctions movement takes hold, those are all factors that will quicken. If the emigration of skilled uh, and uh, uh, Israeli Jews, if the brain drain from Israel continues and accelerates, all those are factors that might bring Israel uh, uh, closer to recognizing that its best interest is not to resist change, but to negotiate it and manage it as best as they can. Well, it, it, again, it would be like for Protestants in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland. It would be the choice between endless war and continued decline, or a chance at inclusion, acceptance, legitimacy, and, uh, and growth as part of something new. That's what it would offer them. Uh, but that's a choice they're obviously not ready to make yet. There are some Israelis, a small minority, who are ready to make that choice and who advocate for this, but the vast majority are not. And, you know, that's not going to happen from one day to the next. And in the meantime, what I think we need to be doing is exactly what we're doing here, talking about this, beginning to imagine what that change looks like, giving Israelis who are ready to embrace change a place to go, telling them there is a vision, there is a future, you have a place in it, you don't have to be pariahs, you don't have to be uh, uh, the, the inheritors of this ugly, brutal system, you can be part of something new. And I think it's our job to go out and start uh, um, uh, developing that vision. And that's a very important part of the work that, that prepares the ground. And Palestinian and Israeli intellectuals and academics are doing that. There's been uh, already um, a couple of conferences are, have either happened or are being planned where Israelis and Palestinians and others are coming together to talk about a one-state solution and what it looks like. That's all part of the groundwork for this change. Okay, I, I mean, you can, read, you can read a lot more from the Hamas Charter, and I can... No, I, I'm going to stop you for a second, um, and I'll let you come back. But you're doing exactly what was done for decades with the PLO, where, you know, Israelis who didn't want to have any change to talk to the PLO would quote from the PLO Charter, as if these documents don't change. I can quote for you from any number of Israeli organizations or settler leaders today, who made statements today or yesterday, who uh, say much uglier things than that about Palestinians. Okay, my point is this, is that you, you know, the Hamas Charter was written in 1988 in the midst of the First Intifada by one man, all right? It wasn't adopted at any convention or conference. You have to look at 
all that has happened since then. You have to look at what Hamas is today, not be stuck on what it was in 1988. If you're interested in change, if you're not interested, the easiest thing to do is to say, these people never change. This is what they really think. And what they say today is just a trick and a lie so that we don't see what they really want. But if you're interested in change, it's worth listening to what they're saying and doing today. And what they're doing is, is undertaking the kind of political transformation that the IRA underwent, where it has to move very cautiously and very slowly, it has to bring its con constituency along, where it takes steps forward and then it takes steps backwards, where it waits to see if there's a response from the other side. That's politics. That's how things change. And if you are interested in change, you recognize that and engage with it. If you're not interested, if you're happy with the status quo, the easiest thing to say is, ah, this is what they said in 1988, this is what's in their hearts, it will never change. Now, on this issue of extremism, I mean, the, the KKK is, was the largest organization in the history of the United States. At its peak, it had four million members. I don't think there's been any organization in this country that was ever larger. And it was no shame to be a member of the KKK. Mayors, police chiefs, fire chiefs, all the great and the good business leaders in towns across the country were members of the KKK. Now, we didn't eradicate the KKK. It still exists. It still exists. But it doesn't dominate our politics. It doesn't stand in the way of those of us, of the vast majority in this country, who have decided that uh, equality before the law is the way to go. So you do not, with all due respect to Noam Chomsky, he's completely wrong about this. His arguments are very weak for reasons that I, I go into at great length in the book. And um, it, the two-state solution is not a pragmatic solution. It's an impossible solution. And the irony here is if I was standing here 20 years ago, uh, there, there would be all these people telling me a two-state solution is, is impossible and, and, and you, know, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't advocate it. And uh, now that's reversed, that supporters of Israel are in love with the two-state solution because it's the only way of that they see left of preserving uh, special and better rights for Jews in the country. And, and what I'm saying is that a two-state solution in 2007 is separate and unequal. This isn't 1957, it's 2007. We need to get over it. Hamas doesn't support a one-state solution. Hamas's position is, its, its position is somewhat ambiguous, but the position expressed by its leadership is, uh, is for a long-term truce with uh, a negotiated settlement in the future, a renewable generation-long truce. And that's come a long way from where they were. And what they're basically saying is we're open. We don't know what the solution is, but we're open. What I do know, what, what we do know, is that there are discussions within Hamas about openly adopting the one-state solution. The, the problem is that they're not willing to do so openly because they know that they'll be accused, as usual, of wanting to destroy Israel. But within Hamas, there is a serious debate about how to put forward proposals that genuinely can break the impasse. Um, I think that, um, that uh, of course, I don't support a boycott of Hamas. I support, yeah, you know, I, I haven't said that, uh, I mean, the notion of boycotting an occupied people is absurd. The, the, what I do support, what I've opposed, let me, let me be clear, what I've opposed all along, I say it in my book, I've said it a zillion times in writing, is I absolutely oppose all violence targeted at civilians, regardless of who the perpetrator is, regardless of who the victim is. And what I think needs to be recognized is that Hamas 
has su suspended its suicide attacks on Israeli civilians more than two years ago, that, uh, that Hamas offered Israel a number of truces which Israel broke by assassinating Hamas leaders, and Israel has had no interest in prolonging the truce that Hamas offered several times. You may not like that, but I think the reality is that Hamas has tried to put forward a different face. And again, it's the easiest thing is to say, we don't want to talk to them. We don't believe they can change. We don't believe they're serious. That's the most comforting thing because it doesn't require you to challenge any of your assumptions. But peace is made by talking to your enemies, not talking to tailored leaders that you handpick. And that's the thing, I think, that Israel has yet to really grasp. Well, on that point, I would just argue that you're using double standard and... How am I using a double I, standard? I believe that Hamas um, has only ceased uh, suicide bombing attacks because of the security situation with Israel has reverted to other tactics, uh, such as using rockets, Qassar rockets. Hamas doesn't fire those rockets. It's a poor, it, doesn't, it doesn't take action to stop them. Is Hamas the government of the Gaza Strip? In, in the Gaza Strip it is. is. Is it recognized by Israel as the government of the Gaza Strip? If Hamas forces come out with arms, won't the Israelis kill them? I'm sorry, what? So Hamas forces, if they appear in public with arms, Israel will kill them. And you're saying that these people should protect Israel? Isn't that absurd? Is it their job to protect Israel? I didn't, I didn't say it was their job to protect Israel, but if they want to support a truce, then it's certainly in their interest. Wouldn't it be in Israel's interest to support a truce? It would be. Okay. And, uh, if there were no rockets coming. All right. Uh, but what, what about settlements? Aren't settlements a form of violence when you take people's land and, and remove them from it? Right, and I support the, uh, the position of the quartet that all Palestinian terrorism has to cease before. Okay, let me ask you a question. Do you think Palestinians have any right in any circumstances to defend themselves? I believe, of course I do, but I don't believe that entails um, attacking... Okay, what would it entail? Well, give me an example of legitimate Palestinian self-defense in I your guess, view. I believe the best self-defense is how the Dalai uh, the Dalai Lama... Or Okay, so, so why doesn't, okay, so why don't, you, why don't you advise the Israeli army to put down its guns and to use the tactics of the Dalai Lama and Gandhi? Well, Isn't that a double standard? I would argue that... So if a palace, no, I just want to get this very clear, that if armed settlers backed by an army come to a Palestinian area and to bulldoze the land, and to take it for Jewish settlement, that the only legitimate form of self-defense is to sit down uh, and do nothing. I believe that the political pressure that would be put on Israel by putting down the arms, by putting down their arms, would be so great uh, that it would uh, put pressure Israel to. Uh, can you tell me? Can you tell me wh how all the non-violent protests that Palestinians have used for decades? Which you probably don't even know about. What? What? How many settlements did that stop? No, I'm informed. I'm, I'm wanting to hear. When? When has there been a uh, situation where there have been completely peaceful protests? What, have you? Have you? Have you heard of Bid? Have you heard of Bidu and Bilain? Let me finish. Uh, at the same time, when there's been absolutely no violence or threat of violence. When has, when has there ever been no Israeli violence? I mean, what, what, what comes clear from this to me is that you, you support Israeli violence and you think Israelis have no right to self-defense. The Palestinians have no right to self-defense. The circle of violence, I think. Um, you have okay. Palestinian terrorism, Israel retaliation. Right, okay. I believe that it's right. a Palestinian... But that's a, very con that's a very convenient way to look at it. Let me, let me ask you a question. Sure. Okay. Uh, and and g give me, give me, your, give, allow, allow me. I, 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 allow me, because I, I think this is a helpful, it's helpful for me. I, and and we'll, we'll move on. Do you know how many Palestinians were killed by the Israeli army in 2006? 
No. No. You never researched it. I don't know the precise number. Give me a rough estimate. It's probably in the hundreds. I don't know. Okay, probably in the hundreds, but you never took the time to go on the internet and find out. I've heard rough estimates in somewhere in the hundreds. Okay, but there are precise numbers. Of course. Right, okay. The precise numbers from the Israeli Human Rights Group, Betselem, is 686. Do you know how many of them were children? No. Okay, will you believe me if I tell you? You can go check it. 141. Okay. Now, do you know how many Israelis were killed by Palestinians in 2006? I don't know. No, you don't know. But you're very concerned about the security of Israel. I believe that Israel has a greater security apparatus. Okay, all right, so, okay, but do you know how many? Can you give me a rough estimate? Less than 10, I don't know. Less than 10 is close, 24. Okay, and you want to tell me that the Palestinians are the terrorists. What's your evidence for that? Well, it was never removed from the Palestinian National Organization's um, charters for having Israel. I mean, what, what's your evidence that Palestinians want to eradicate the Jews? They don't refute the, they refute the existence of Israel. So well, how is that the same as wanting to eradicate Jews? I mean, is... is so that's the same as wanting to eradicate Jews, that, that, that if there's no Jewish state, there's no Jews. No. It's close enough. So is eradicating a white supremacist state in South Africa the same as eradicating whites? Good argument, but no. Okay, so, all right. I, I don't see how there's any connection. Is, uh, Palestinians, you're saying that unless they support a state that legally discriminates against them and considers them inferior, that they want to eradicate Jews. Well, that's an argument for privilege. Then what privilege does each Palestinian have that's different from each Jewish person inside a Jewish state compared to the apartheid that you Jews or black people compared to whites? What privilege does a Palestinian have? I don't understand. Palestinians don't have privileges in the country. Jews have privileges. By law and by practice. So what Palestinians want to eradicate is Jewish supremacy. They don't want to eradicate Jews. What they want is equality. How try to voice this in the correct um, fashion, but how would you be attaining that quality? See, the problem that I have is that the Palestinian National Organization call for Israel to not exist. But if you're choosing to go for it... Which Palestinian national organizations call for Israel not to exist? Not Mahmoud Abbas. He's desperately begging Israel to, to recognize him, and, and every day he says he recognizes Israel. As for Hamas, their position is, how can you ask, I mean, for example, I as a Palestinian, you want to say to me, I should recognize Israel. Can you tell me where Israel is? Where its borders are? Off the top of my head. Does anybody in the room know where Israel's borders are? Does anyone know where Israel's borders are? Israel is the only state in the world that has no declared borders. What am I supposed to recognize? That's because the Arab government will never have peace agreements with this. Yes, well, okay. So Israel is demanding recognition when it doesn't recognize from people who it, who it doesn't recognize that they, that they have any right to be present in the country. And it's asking for recognition as a, as a state that gives ethnic privilege to the people in power. Of course, that would be very convenient for Israel. Wouldn't it be lovely and simple if the Palestinians would recognize Israel's right to violate their rights? They're not going to do that. It's a fantasy. And for, 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 for decades, 
South African whites said, you must recognize the, white, the Afrikaners' right to self-determination. And blacks properly, properly understood that as a, right to white, uh, as a demand for a recognition of white minority rule. So you can't start from the premise that you don't recognize anyone, but you demand re unconditional recognition from the people whose lives you control. It's, it's, it's really a strange situation. People in Gaza who are being starved by Israel, who are having their water and electricity and fuel cut off, who are being bombarded uh, uh, every night, who children can't sleep because there are sonic booms every night all over Gaza, they're being asked to recognize Israel? That's chutzpah. <laughs> I just had an interesting thing that I was thinking about. A couple years back, 2020, which is a television program, I actually went to Gaza and went into a Palestinian school. And they asked the teacher, how is it possible to kill another person? So that would be against the fabric of your belief, no. And the teacher showed me they went through a textbook, and they equated a Jew to a dog. So it's not a problem to kill a dog, it's a problem to kill a Jew. And it's very reminiscent of another I guess we'll call him a fascist leader who took control of the country, Mr. Hitler, who also had a very close alliance with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Okay, let me, stop, let me stop you. Let me stop you. I mean, this whole business of textbooks, I didn't see 2020, but I have read and I go into great detail in this uh, on, on the whole myth of the textbooks in my book. Um, there's been no curriculum uh, in the world that has been more studied than the Palestinian curriculum and more misrepresented. And there have been uh, many international studies carried out that totally falsify the claim that Palestinian textbooks teach hatred and teach all this. And you can check the references in my, in my book and in others. But the point of that claim is really this. The, the, the point of it is to say that we, you know, the, the reason Palestinians feel so bad about Israelis is not because they're shot on the way to school, but because of what they see in their textbooks. And isn't that convenient? And the Palestinians, you know, and then you go from that and it's a short, uh, a short a path to the Palestinians of Hitler. This is really, you know, you can keep doing this forever. You know, you can keep doing it forever. And as long as you feel immune, as long as you feel that there's no need, I mean, there's no difference when you read the demonology, the demonization that uh, was used to deny rights to black people, to African Americans in this country, and to uh, Africans in South Africa, and to Catholics in Northern Ireland, it was exactly the same. It's that they come from a culture that doesn't value life. They're not civilized. They're barbarians. Are you prepared to say that today about any of those people? But you're prepared to say it about Palestinians. Yeah, I think that's embedded in the fabric of the education. Okay, isn't that, isn't that convenient? They teach their children. What, what does Israel teach its children when you see Israeli schoolgirls writing messages from Israel with love on 155 millimeter shells that are fired into Lebanese villages? What kind of society teaches its children that? And I don't hear anyone talking about that. Well, I mean, it's, just, it's an interesting point because when you have a, you know, a civilization where in Al Jazeera, 2004, they pulled them, and 82% of the Palestinians supported suicide bombing. So if it's embedded in the fact, now you're going to say, you don't believe my statistics, I don't believe your I, I just, I just, it's so easy. You can go to bed at night and sleep saying none of it is about, about Israel. It's that these people are bad. And, you know, do you know when the first suicide bombing was? Do you know when the first, let, do you know when the first suicide bombing was? No, sir, please Okay, you've never investigated it? No. Okay. Should I tell you the date? All right. April 7th, 1994, took a hundred years of Zionist colonization before a Palestinian blew himself up. Do you know what happened 40 days before the first Palestine suicide uh, Palestinian suicide bombing? 
Uh, I just would like to answer the Palestinian suicide bombing was as a result of their inability to eradicate Israel in the 48 war. Do you know do you know what happened? Do you know what happened 40 days before the first Palestine suicide Palestinian suicide bomb? Yeah, 40 years before that. I'm just asking if you know what happened 40 days before. Okay, the massacre by Baruch Goldstein, who is still revered as a saint by the settlers in Kiryat Arba, of 29 Palestinians in the uh, Ibrahimi Mosque in Hebron. Baruch Goldstein, as said by the government, was wrong. Okay. Okay, but 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 should I should I say should I say should I say that that uh, that uh, that uh, massacres uh, by Israeli soldiers and settlers that uh, stealing land that uh, 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 uprooting trees that that those are Jewish values that those are inherent in the culture I don't believe that I don't believe that. Yeah. Okay. I'm done. Next. Thank you. Um, can you speak a little bit about what Israel's neighbors are doing to help peace and human rights? And do you support sanctions for any non-democratic countries uh, besides Israel? I support sanctions when sanctions will be effective. And I think they would be effective in Israel's case. The case Israel's case is, is slightly different from other situations. I think there's a strong moral dimension that this is a system based on racial discrimination and superiority, which in, in the international system uh, has been uh, really reviled uh, based on the uh, UN uh, Convention on the Eradication of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, Convention, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and the fact that this is an international conflict, that Israel is an occupying power governed by the Fourth Geneva Conventions, and there is an obligation on the international community to intervene. It's in the Fourth Geneva Convention. There is an obligation to intervene. Uh, and th when that obligation has been uh, uh, has not been fulfilled by uh, 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 world powers, I think that there is an obligation on civil society to do that. And of course, that's why many pro-Israel organizations have supported the, the Darfur sanctions movement. That's, that's their issue, and they want to support that. And they've gotten different universities to divest, uh, and, and they think that's a legitimate tactic. I think it's a legitimate tactic in the case of Israel. Now, what are the uh, Arab states doing? Well, Egypt made a peace treaty with Israel in 1979 and has uh, respected it scrupulously. Jordan did the same. Syria has been begging for negotiations. The entire Arab League has now twice in 2002 uh, and then again last March uh, offered Israel full peace in exchange for full withdrawal from the occupied territories. A, uh, an initiative that Israel didn't even bother to reply to. So I think that uh, they've done quite a lot to try to preserve peace, and we've seen no response at all from the Israeli side. I think you made clear your feelings on Israel. I'm just, your part of what you're saying is certainly equality and all is, is, is a mm -hmm. I support that everywhere. I'm not. I'm not against. I'm not. I'm the strength of your argument because no one would argue against that. Yeah. But I feel that choosing to pick on Israel's democracy, that aspect of your argument, in a, in a zone that I would have to put them as the most democratic. Really, the most democratic. So it doesn't bother you that half the people under Israeli rule have no say whatsoever in the so-called democratic government. Inequalities and violence bothers me. I just, I wanted to broaden out just a little bit sure. to the surrounding area. Is there any criticism of the governments surrounding that? Of course. Inequality. Of course. I mean, did, it, did anything I say suggest I hold them up as a model? Yes, only by omission. I mean, there's, there's so, because I didn't talk about Thailand and Burma and India and Southeast Asia, I mean, I wrote a book about Palestine. That's what I'm here to talk about. Right. So, I as a Palestinian, I as a Palestinian have the burden to, 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 to engage in all these struggles before I can talk about Palestine? When it applies to what you talk about, when you talk about Egypt signing a peace treaty and then assassination of, of the leader of Egypt. From, and I'm saying, how does the surrounding area 
help or hinder. Well, there's a great deal of anger in the surrounding area about what Israel is doing to the Palestinians, and that makes it very hard for governments to make peace with Israel when their people are so outraged by what's going on. But I mean, you know, you say I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm picking on Israel. But, but what you just said was actually addressing my question. Okay. And he's saying that, yes, that's a tension. It's difficult if someone makes peace and someone kills them or threatens them. You know, I'm not, I'm listening to what you're saying, but I'm just trying to broaden it to say what is the role of the other countries surrounding the area. And I don't, I believe it's in their interest in some ways to look at Israel as the enemy and take the Oh, this is, I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. I mean, the reality is that if you go out into the street in, uh, in Jordan and have a pro-Palestinian demonstration, you'll be arrested in five minutes. What all these countries are terrified of is their people's anger at what Israel is doing. They're all desperate to suppress it. They're all desperate for any peace deal. The idea that they actually stoke up anti-Israeli feeling to, uh, to uh, uh, distract from their own issues is totally belied by the facts. Uh, and and the, the, the reason that, uh, the, uh, and, and I, I want to go back to the earlier point, I do think we have a special responsibility to, to confront Israel and to face the boy, uh, to, to face up to what it's doing because Israel is so dependent on U.S. support. We have a special responsibility. And, uh, you know, there are uh, terrible human rights abuses all over the world, some of them aided by our government as well. But Israel is uniquely, Israel is still the largest aid recipient. And, uh, and, and clearly, we have a moral responsibility to intervene and to be to, and, and to be sleepless about what is going on in Israel and to raise it at every opportunity. I can go on for a few more hours, but you have to tell me when to stop. So uh, maybe if, uh, I'll tell you what, if anyone else wants to speak, come up to the microphone now and we'll, we'll, I'll make sure everyone has a chance to talk and we'll make it shorter so that we get through people quickly. Okay. I apologize, but during the presentation, I was exchanging text messages with my mother because... How is she? Oh, she is fine. Okay, good. Say hello to her for me. Yeah. Um, and I knew that you'd be interested to know that there was a Palestinian man who going to talk about Israel and, you know, stuff like that. And uh, coincidentally, she's hanging out with her Israeli friend right now. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to know what she would think about uh, your one-state solution and all that stuff. Shouldn't really give me a good response, but hard to get a, a good know, response by text message. I know. But uh, she did say that Israel is the only place in the world where Jews are welcomed with, like, you know, no questions. There's, you know, that's that's why they want Israel because it's the it's their only like sanctuary. Well, that's a very strange argument. I mean, I know that it's one that people that no, I understand, and you don't have to apologize. But but it's it's one that is is sort of um, you know, uh, pardon the metaphor, mother's milk for many people. They're raised with it, and it it, it defies the logic. I mean, it's used to justify support for Israel, but most Jews in the world don't live in Israel. I think it would be very hard to argue that Jews in Canada or in the United States are not welcome. Um, I think that uh, uh, one of the great things about this country is, is how uh, integrated uh, and what a model of integration the American Jewish community is, uh, coming uh, as immigrants and refugees and, and becoming you know, the, one of the most successful uh, 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 communities in the country. And the, the fact is that the majority of the world's Jews don't live in Israel. There's uh, about 13 million Jews in the world, according to the best estimates from uh, worldwide Jewish organizations. Uh, the largest group lives in the United States. The second largest group lives in Israel. Um, and uh, there's 800,000 Israelis, now close to a million, who've left Israel. Most of them have come to live in the United States. They've decided the United States is a better place to be. 
Now, the idea that Israel is the safe haven for Jews, I mean, we're told this all the time. At the same time, we're also told that Israel is always five minutes from annihilation. And, you know, if it's not the Palestinians, it's the Syrians. If it's not the Syrians, it's Saddam Hussein. Now Saddam Hussein is gone, it's Iran. Once Iran, you know, if heaven forbid the U.S. launches a war against Iran, then who knows what, what it will be. I mean, Israel is the most dangerous place in the world to be a Jew. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a mad idea. Uh, and I think that the country can only become uh, a safe, welcoming place for Jews as it was throughout its history is to end the exclusivist claim, to recognize the multicultural and multi-religious history of the country and to live up to that. That's the only way it will be a safe haven for Jews. Well, I mean, where would you like them to send the aid? Israel doesn't allow aid to go into Gaza. So would you be happy if Arab states send a lot of aid to Gaza? Well, I just mean in general. So, no, no, I, I want to be specific. Let's not be general. The, many Arab countries and Arab people have wanted to send aid to Gaza, where 90% of the people are now reliant on UN food aid because of the siege that Israel has imposed on Gaza, okay? And the United States, at Israel's behest, has threatened any banks that transfer money from Arab states to Gaza, okay? So there were many Arab states that wanted to send aid to Gaza, and they were warned, your banks will be banned from doing business in the United States if you do that. So that's one example of how they've wanted to help Palestinians. And there are many others, of course, because uh, Arab states have given billions of dollars to support Palestinians uh, over the years. Uh, so, but, you know, the primary responsibility is Israel's. Israel is the country that dispossessed them. Israel is the country Palestinians come from. I come from Israel. It's, it's horrifying, I think, for some people to hear that. But my mother was born in what is now Israel. And I am excluded solely. I can't go there. I can't live there. Only because I'm the wrong religion, for no other reason. And, and that is something that I cannot accept. It's immoral. It's frankly immoral. I mean, I would never accept a state that said that someone can't come to it just because they're a Jew. The other thing I just wanted to say was, um, was just an anecdote, which was just the fact that um, somebody I know whose um, cousin was affected by a suicide bomb was mm -hmm. taken to a Gaza hospital, was treated by a Palestinian doctor and was laying next to a, uh, someone who had blown up the bus and both were given the best care possible, the Jew from the Palestinian doctor. And so I think those stories are also out there that are not really told from either side. So there are stories like that that have been very touching and I think exist in, in much of the country that I've seen both being there and from stories I've heard. Well, I, I, I thank you for that. I've never heard of a case of a suicide bomber surviving a bombing which killed anyone. They were, they were victims of terror and there were terrorists yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, that, that may be the case, but of course, I would urge you to look into the medical situation because um, there are thousands of Palestinians who are not allowed uh, through checkpoints to get medical treatment. Many hundreds have died because the Israeli army doesn't let them get to hospitals. I'm not talking about hospitals in Israel. I'm talking about if you live in one of the outlying villages and you're trying to get to a hospital in Nablus or Bethlehem. There are Palestinians who've died because there, there are uh, insufficient antibiotics and dialysis supplies and other things in Gaza because of the Israeli blockade. So these stories can be very heartwarming, but then they're the exception. The rule is that Palestinians are being denied medical treatment because of the occupation, and we can't allow our hearts to be warmed and ignore that reality. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, something that I'm just, like, that I'm, I'm trying to understand for myself, in terms of a one-state solution, 
Now you have two very distinct peoples inhabiting two parts of the land, mm -hmm. within both parts of the mm -hmm. land at this point. But how would you say that, that I, by throwing them all into one state, at this point where they, I don't think that either one recognizes the history of the other, and they don't appreciate either's connection to this land or its, to its cultural identity as well as religious identities and so forth. Now, how will that work to just throw this and create this new amalgamation of this new identity? And how will it then foster the unique identities for each people in terms of, now I know for, for my own self, in terms of what has become a Jewish identity because of this state of Israel. Mm -hmm. There have been many negative aspects and there have been many new, for myself, many secular new identities in terms mm -hmm. of having as holidays, as national holidays, and the being of, of the Jewish calendar. Now by throwing these two people in, how will the unique cultural identities of Palestinians mm -hmm. and the unique cultural identities of Israelis be upheld? Well, <clears throat> that's a very good question. And that's when where you, we can get hints of how to do this from Northern Ireland and from South Africa. And what we see is that it's very difficult, that the challenge of forging a common citizenship and a common identity out of completely antagonistic narratives is, is, is a huge challenge. In Northern Ireland, where I think people may not appreciate how deep the conflict is, we see the beginnings of that. So <clears throat> when I was in Dublin, uh, a few months ago, I saw a speech by Jerry Adams, the president of Sinn Féin, where he talked about the Irish tricolor, the flag, the green and orange, as representing the two traditions in Ireland, green for the uh, Celtic nationalist identity and orange for the Protestant Ulster unionist identity. An extraordinary statement one you couldn't have imagined him making five or ten years ago, of reinterpreting the Irish flag, the symbol of Irish nationalism and resistance to British rule, as being something inclusive that now includes the Ulster Protestants. So that was a, an act of reinterpretation of, uh, of a nationalist or sectarian symbol as being universal. We've seen the symbolic change the, uh, the uh, police, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, which was effectively a Protestant militia wearing uniforms, a sectarian militia wearing uniforms, just like the Israeli police and army are nothing but a Jewish sectarian militia wearing uniforms as far as Palestinians are concerned. So taking that sectarian police force and its symbols and making them into universal symbols that all the people in Northern Ireland could identify with and Catholics could begin to feel safe joining the police force and so on. So this is very hard work of reinterpreting these symbols. On the other side, a symbol of Protestant chauvinism in Northern Ireland or, or, uh, and uh, uh, of, of denigration of Catholics was the commemoration of the Battle of the Boyne in 1690, which was, a, you know, which was commemorated as this Protestant victory against Catholics and is celebrated every year with very you know, bombastic marches which, which go through Catholic areas in a very uh, provocative way. And what we saw was Ian Paisley, the Protestant leader, now the First Minister of Northern Ireland, visiting the site of the Battle of the Boyne this very sectarian symbol with the Irish Prime Minister and reinterpreting it, actively reinterpreting it, planting a tree and, and talking about it now as, as, as a place of, of, of reconciliation. So we see the very active efforts to go from a political settlement to creating symbols and, and, and reinterpreting um, holidays and commemorations that were sectarian in a way that are inclusive. So, for example, what you s might celebrate, I don't know, as Israeli Independence Day is for me a day of disaster. It, it commemorates the expulsion of the Palestinians. It would clearly be a tough job to reconcile those views, but we see it happening in other places, and there is now research, good research, that shows that 
uh, in Northern Ireland, young children start to develop their community identities at a very young age, uh, as young as three. But what's happened in the past 10 years since the ceasefire is that their, their community identities, so they still identify very strongly as Irish or British, but what's also happening is the vast majority are also uh, identifying as Northern Irish. So that the, there is a common identity at the same time that coexists with these community identities. So what I'm saying is that I don't know what it will look like. It will be hard work, but we can begin to learn from how this is going in other places that have been more courageous and more far-sighted than Israelis and Palestinians have been so far. You're the, the last two, so you go first and then you'll have the final word. Yeah. The West Bank and Gaza are not part of Israel. So how can you use that as proof that Israel is a democratic country? People, every person in Israel, in Israel has a vote and gets counted. So how can you say that? Because people in Gaza and West Bank don't get to vote for the Israeli prime minister and the cabinet, that Israel isn't a democratic state. Well, you're, you're demonstrating exactly what I said. It's a very convenient fiction to say that the West Bank and Gaza are not part of Israel. Legally, they're not. Legally, we don't know where the borders of Israel are. I don't know if Tel Aviv is in Israel because the eastern border of Israel has never been declared. It might be, it might not be. We don't know. But nevertheless, what I want to say is that de facto, Israel rules the West Bank and Gaza. Nobody can move in the West Bank without permission from the uh, Israeli army. Nobody can move, not from one village to another. Uh, the entire population registry is controlled by the State of Israel. There's half a million settlers living in the West Bank. Israel controls all the external borders, the water sources, the airspace, the electromagnetic spectrum. There's been a de facto annexation of the West Bank and Gaza, but the convenient fiction that these people are not part of the state, because if we admitted they were part of the state, we'd have to either give them the vote or admit that what we have is apartheid. That's exactly what you're doing. You're engaging in that fiction because you understand the consequences of admitting that those Palestinians live under the rule and authority of the Israeli government, and most of them have known no other government, because that's been the situation for 40 years, Lo as long as formal apartheid lasted in South Africa. Um, it might be. We don't know. I mean, the point I'm making is that, that, that um, the option of preserving Israeli Jewish supremacy and power at all costs is not an option, that, that there has to be an opening. There has to be a recognition that it's not only Israeli Jews who live in this country, and soon it won't even be the majority. It's already 50 percent, and soon Israeli Jews will be a minority in the country that they rule. And so 
it's, uh, it's not an option to, to maintain this system of strict, separate, and unequal. There will have to be a change. And that change will bring about unpredictable things. We don't know the end of the story in South Africa. We don't know what it will look like in 20 years' time. We know that in this country, 50 years after uh, the end of formal apartheid in many parts of this country, we don't have equality and perfect harmony. In Chicago, where I live, we have a very high degree of racial segregation, residential segregation. Our schools are effectively segregated. Uh, this is, these are all legacies of, of centuries of, uh, of injustice and exploitation that we have largely failed to uh, properly address. And one of the lessons that I think Israelis and Palestinians will have to take away is that it's not enough to have a political settlement, even if Israelis and Palestinians agree tomorrow to a democratic constitution instead of a, an ethnic sectarian state as exists now. Even if they agree to that tomorrow, that's not enough. There also has to be an enormous effort made, huge investments made to, for restitution, to take from those who have hoarded unjustly from themselves and give to those who've been denied. And that's very difficult because people don't like to give up power and privilege. And I suspect that Israeli Jews, being human beings like all others in the world, will try to hold on to as much privilege and power as they can. And that, that it would take an enormous wisdom for them to learn the lessons, to read the writing uh, 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 on the wall and say, we have to do this willingly. But if, if they really do look at the, the situations that have gone before, they would see that that is the best way and um, the sooner the better. And the best way would be to negotiate uh, a system in which they can uh, preserve uh, the country. The country will remain a homeland for Jews uh, and a place of a more vibrant Jewish culture because there wouldn't be this need to press gang all of Jewish culture into this insane uh, hyper-nationalism that Israel demands. And Jews could be all the things they used to be when you had Jewish communities all over the world. And that could be reflected in the country. Instead of suppressing all the different Jewish identities and forcing this European Ashkenazi model uh, on them, we could see the flourishing of all the Jewish cultures that came to the country. So it's somewhat unpredictable. We don't know. That's something no one can, can, can say. But the possibilities and the promise, I think, are enormous. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. You've been incredibly patient. <laughs>